Uh, but in, in our last study, for those of you who are on for that, we kind of saw the, the tragic event of the death of Josiah and how that would have been so upsetting for Jeremiah. Uh, you know, Jeremiah had a really difficult job as it was, didn't he? You know, but to have a godly king on the throne would have made it such a comfort. But now that Josiah has died, things were going to get much tougher for Jeremiah. Come to Jeremiah chapter 12. And you see that... Uh, a phrase here that is basically sometimes it's actually used today even to say things are going to get a whole lot tougher. Jeremiah 12, God says to Jeremiah in verse 5, if you've run with the footmen and they've wearied thee, how can you contend with horses? That's uh, kind of just have a think about that. If you've run with the footmen and they've wearied thee. So in other words, if you've run with you know a pace that you've already found wearying now how on earth are you going to contend while you're running with horses things are going to get super tough for jeremiah and we're going to see why let's go back to the king's record again 2 kings 23 so 2 kings chapter 23 and right at the end of that chapter we're going to go in and see why things are going to get so much more challenging now for Jeremiah. <clears throat> so remember I told you that Josiah died when he went up to try to deal with Pharaoh, who was going up to Assyria to the Battle of Carchemish, and that's recorded there in verse 29 and 30. So there's the, the death then of Josiah. And we see in verse 30, the servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulchre. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's stead. And it's interesting that the people of the land made Jehoahaz the king. So you can see on the screen that Jehoahaz was actually the second son of Josiah. The first was Jehoiakim. Now, why then was that the case? Well, Jehoiakim, we'll see, was really horrible. The people, I think, decided it'd be better to make Jehoahaz the king, but actually he just doesn't last long. Verse 31. So they made him, verse 30, it says that the people took Jehoahaz, the son of Jehoahaz, and made him king. So the people are the ones who put him on the throne. But, verse 31, Jehoahaz is 23 years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months in Jerusalem, his mother's name was Hamuto, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, not the same Jeremiah. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. And Pharaoh Nekil, Nico put him in bands at Riblar in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and put the land to a tribute of an hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Nico made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah, his father, turned his name to Jehoiakim and took Jehoahaz away. And he came to Egypt and died there. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He, ex and he exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land, of everyone according to his taxation, to give it unto Pharaoh Necho. So <coughs> Jehoiakim is made king by Pharaoh. So why then? Well, Pharaoh comes up and it... Egypt at this point is still a pretty powerful nation. He take, takes Jehoahaz down to Egypt and he puts nasty Jehoiakim on the throne and he changes his name from Eliakim, as you saw there in verse 34, to Jehoiakim. Now, Eliakim means God sets up. Eliakim, God sets up to meaning Jehoiakim, meaning Yahweh sets up. So we think, well, why did he do this? Well, it suggests that Pharaoh is a cunning guy. You know, he knows that if he can make the people of the land think that Yahweh, the God of Israel, set him up, they're more likely to listen to him then. Of course, it's not for a moment that, that Pharaoh hasn't put him there to elevate, you know, he hasn't put him there to elevate Yahweh. He wants him there because he knows he's a nasty piece of work and he'll get more taxes out of the people. And so that suggests as well, doesn't it, as to why the people put GOA has on to the throne because actually they, you know, in their mind, actually he was better than at least Jehoiakim was. But Pharaoh wanted 
Jehoiakim on the throne because he wanted somebody nasty on the throne to get the taxes out of the people. Well, the first thing that Jehoiakim does is recorded for us in Jeremiah 26. So let's go there now. And I mean, it's basically the way to sort of have a go at putting the chronology of uh, Jeremiah together is to pick out these type of chapters, first of all, that you it tells you at the beginning of the chapter or in, at some point in the chapter, who's on the throne at this time. Um, and once you've got those together, then you start connecting other ones. It might be that the kind of the next chapter so clearly links with it, you're able to say, okay, well, that one would go there. Uh, so if you're ever having a go at doing the chronology of Jeremiah, this is your kind of key points, these sort of things where we see in Jeremiah 26, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. So we know where that's going to go in the chronology. But in this chapter, we see Jehoiakim send a group of delegates down to Egypt to fetch one of the prophets of God who had run there for safety. Uh, so Jeremiah 26 and verse 22. Jehoiakim the king sent men into Egypt, namely Nathan the son of Akbor and certain men with him into Egypt, and they fetched forth Uriah out of Egypt, <coughs> sorry, and brought him into Jehoiakim the king, who slew him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Uriah, if you would followed cross references, what you see is one of the prophets of God. And sadly, Jeremiah, Jehoiakim's just got no respect at all for the prophets. And he sends for this man and gets him brought up to where he is and happily slays him. So you can see for Jeremiah, you, you, know, you thought it was hard going with the footman. You, now you're going to have to run with horses. Things were going to get really tough with a vile man like this on the throne. Well, it's during the beginning of Jehoiakim's reign that God sends Jeremiah down to see the potter. So let's go to that chapter that we read together, chapter 18. It's thought that the, the potter's field was on the south of the city, uh, the south of Valley of Hinnom. And you know, over time, we sort of start getting a picture of how Jerusalem is and you know that actually down on the southwest, or southeast side, sorry, you've got there where would be the potter's field of the New Testament. And, and archaeologists have found a big bank of clay there. So, you know, they're absolutely confident this is where this was. So let's just read those verses again from verse one. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house. There will I cause thee to hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought his work on the wheels. So picture it, you know, for, you know years ago when I was trying to do this study, um, I actually went down to a potter and uh, had a go at doing some pottery to get an idea of this. And uh, yeah, it's interesting for me. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever done pottery, but what it really struck me is you really have to work hard to actually get the kind of the clay to go into the shape that you want. It's not kind of some simple thing of just touching it. It just happens. You have to really work hard, like as in you're really working hard on the clay physically, as well as obviously having the skill then to know what to do uh, with it. But he, he's watching this potter making things on this potter's wheel. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the, of the potter. So that's a key word in Jeremiah, by the way, that word marred, often translated destroyed. So it's, it's, it's useless, this one. So he made it again as another vessel. That's the great thing about clay, isn't it? It goes wrong, don't matter, here we go, let's start again. As it seemed good to the potter to make it. So we can see this potter working away. Of course, the potter wants to make something good. When things go wrong with the clay, it starts again, once again, to try to make something good. And whilst he's watching this potter, the word of God comes to him. Verse five, the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant shall I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom? Here's our key words, to pluck up to pull down, to destroy. If that nation against whom I pronounce turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then will I repent of the good, or as I said, I would benefit it. So he's saying, look, 
You know, can you not see that I, as the potter, I've got this choice to, as to how, what I'm going to make. And depending on whether the people want to be ma ma malleable and made into something good, I'll make them something good. But if actually they their behaviour is so awful, then I'm not going to use that then for, for that. And so Jeremiah is learning from God. And it's something, too, that we need to learn that God can do whatever he wants. He could make it perfect. That's true. But he's chosen to work with men. He's formed us from the ground. In fact, if I uh, click the PowerPoint here, you can see that the word for the, the potter um, is the same word that God uses in Genesis 2. The Lord formed okay, man of the dust of the ground. We're made from clay. This word formed is the word that we're seeing here when we read the, about the pot. It's the same word in verse 11 as well as the word frame. Behold, I frame. This is the word potter again. It's about the fact that God is the creator. I form. This is what the potter is doing. He's creating things. And the lesson goes on because Jeremiah and we too need to learn that God wants Israel and all of us to be made into something good. That's what God wants. Even if we're difficult to mould, as a loving father, he'll work with us. He'll put us under pressure to shape us into something that's very good. And the pressure times for us are, are the struggles that God puts our way. So there will be times in our lives when we will struggle, when life seems very difficult. But we have to accept that this could well be the potter, the Lord God Almighty, working us. The Apostle Peter wrote these words. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And I put it there as another translation. If you are suffering according to God's will, keep on doing what's right and trust yourself to the God who made you. Of course, if we won't put our trust in God, and we won't let him work in our lives, then there comes a point, if we won't be shaped by him, then he has to let us go in the way that we want to go. In the end, that's what God said. God has created a creation who's got free will because God wants, is interested in people who want his ways. If we don't want his ways, in the end, God will allow that. Yes, he wants the best for us, but he's only interested in those who want the, 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 what he wants for us. And so God will, in the end, let us go in the direction that we want to go. If the clay vessel refuses to go in the right direction, then God will fix it as it is. So he says in verse 11, behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return you now everyone from his evil way. Make your ways and your doings good. They said, there's no hope. We will walk after our own devices. These people, they want to just do their own thing. And in the end, God will allow them to go their own way. Well, let's stick a marker in Jeremiah 18 and come to Romans 9, because this is one of the chapters that picks up regarding the potter. The Lord God is the one who's working with the clay, us. The chapter is all about election, predestination. And the example that's given of someone who was obstinate before God and wouldn't be changed is that of Pharaoh. So he says in verse 17, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this very purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth, that therefore hath he mercy on whom he have mercy, whom he will, he hardeneth. Now, I think of the clay. In the end, God will harden it as he wants it to be. Well, on first reading, one can sort of think, well, poor old Pharaoh, he's got no chance of being in the kingdom. You know, it, God just hardens him as he is, you know. But poor old Pharaoh, he's got no choice. God's the one that's just being moulding people and uh, he moulds those he doesn't want as it's a, into kind of these hard vessels that are going to get broken and moulds those who he does want into the characters that will be in the kingdom. Is there any choice in all this? God wants free will. Remember that. Remember Genesis, the very beginning, God set man up with free will. That's why choice was put there. You no, know, don't eat this tree. If you, there's no choice. There's no free will. God wants us to have choice. And if we go to the life of Pharaoh, we'll see 
that he actually ended up as he wanted to be. Come to, um, am I going to get to turn to this? I think it's probably worth it. No, I won't. I'm just going to show you on the screen, okay? So let's just uh, look on the screen here at when the plagues came to Egypt. You remember how Moses is told by God to keep going to Pharaoh and telling him that uh, this is what's going to happen if he doesn't let his people go. And what you need to take notice there is Pharaoh's heart. And no doubt many of you would have seen this before. In fact, I can kind of remember the first time I learned this was on uh, Bunkhouse, one of the Malvern uh, things when I was a teenager. But you can see, can't you, that six times Pharaoh hardens his own heart. But the phrase normally goes, Pharaoh hardened his heart, he hearkened not unto them. He wouldn't listen to God. So in the end, God makes him what he wants to be. God steps in and in the end hardens Pharaoh's heart for him, as it were. So what we learned from that is if we're determined not to let God mould us, not to accept the trials God gives us in our lives, if we won't listen to his word and actually change from what we read, then in the end, God would allow us to go the way that we want to go. And so Paul writes in verse 20, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? So I'm in Romans 9 again, verse 20. Who are you to, to go back to God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me thus? Why, what arrogance to go to God? Well, no, I, I don't like the way that I am. Why have you made me thus? God is in control. He wants to make us vessels of honour, things that are good. Verse 23 says that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he'd afore prepared unto glory. God wants to make us vessels of glory. But if after much endurance and working on us, we won't be molded. If we keep listening to the word of God, but actually, you know, for us, we're just pushing our own way then God will make us vessels of dishonour. We're all made of the same lump. Some people are made to be ones of honour through the work of the Lord Jesus. Some are made for dishonour. It's what, in the end, you choose. God will reluctantly allow it if you choose to reject his ways. Come back to Jeremiah 18 again. Hopefully you managed to stick a marker in there when I said. And turn to Jeremiah 18 once more, where we can hopefully see how God works a little bit more here. Jeremiah is saying that there is an end to the long suffering of the potter. The people want to determine their own shape, that they're like Pharaoh. They, they don't want to listen to God. They're defying the potter to follow their own lust. Look at verse 18. Then said the people, come, let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us smite him with the tongue. Let us not give heed to any of his words. It's crazy. They're saying, look, we've got the law. That's not going anywhere now. So why are we listening to, to this idiot? And that's how rude they're being really, isn't it, about Jeremiah. We can devise our own devices. It's so dangerous, their thinking. They thought they could be the potter, that they didn't need God. They didn't want to listen to Jeremiah speaking the word of God. Come, let's devise devices against Jeremiah. The law shall not perish. We've got that from the priest, nor the counsel, from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. We've got these things. Come, let us smite him with the tongue. Let's not give heed to any of his words. And I think it's so dangerous, you know, once people have got, you know, let's not pretend that these people cannot have the same attitude that the majority of people have. Uh, and we can even have if we start to say, well, do you know, I, let's not listen to what this one says. Let's not listen to the word of God here. We've got the word of God. Let's be, try and make our own path here. Let's just try and take what we want to take from it. It's the attitude that says that leave me alone, God. Let me shape myself. I, I'll take random verses from the Lord. We've got this. We can we can just use it as we want to use it. Devise our own devices. I'll think what I want to think and the attitudes that I want to have, I'll have. That's such a dangerous attitude. And it's one that's so important that we learn. We must never justify wrong actions 
by grabbing a verse here or there. They go, wow, we've got the word. I can I can justify this. It says here, uh, God loves everybody. D don't worry about it. Let's, let's just do whatever we want to live, do. Well, in chapter 19, we'd say that this is the next chapter. You know, this is in chronological order because now look at the theme. The Lord said, go buy a potter's earthen bottle. So you can see that you know, the connection there. So here Jeremiah is told, go and get an earthen pot. So he goes off, buys one of these pots. And it's no doubt like the one he's just seen the potter kind of making. So he perhaps bought it from that same potter. Then he heads out to the east gate. The, it's the rubbish gate. It's the, the Valley of Hinnom. You know, in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, he spoke about Hades, you know, where the worm dies not, or the, the fires never quenched because there was a constant fire burning out there that they threw all the rubbish on. And that's the gate that he's now going to, verse 2. Go forth to the valley of the son of Hinnom, Hinnom which is by the entrance of the east gate. So that's where he's going now, okay? So he's heading out, and those of you who've been to Jerusalem, if you've not been there, honestly, go. It's an amazing place. You know, you could be able to picture going through this gate now, be able to see the valley before you, still there, of course. And uh, there he's looking at where this rubbish dump would have been. And he's told to take with him the ancients of the land, the old pots, as it were, who are fixed in their ways. Verse one, let's read it together. Thus saith the Lord, go and buy a potter's earthen bottle. Take of the ancients of the people and the ancients of the priests. Go forth to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim there these words that I shall tell thee. Say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, that whosoever heareth his ears shall tingle. Because... They've forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burned incense to, in, unto other gods who neither they nor their fathers have known nor the kings of Judah and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. And so Jeremiah gives the most harsh lecture ever. But actually, if you kept reading this lecture that he gives to them, you'll see it's all seeped in Deuteronomy. You, you behave like this. So these are the consequences. You see your margin keeps going back to Deuteronomy. And, you know, that's worth, again, you know, if you're following these studies up, just keep looking for connections back to Deuteronomy, that law that was found. Jeremiah picking up on it and telling them, listen to this. But then God tells him in verse 10. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee. So remember these ancient people there in verse one, these people fixed in their ways. Jeremiah's being told, got this pot that you've got and smash it in front of them. Verse 11, thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, even so will I break this people and this city as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Topheth till there be no place to bury. Now, once the, the pot has been heated up, it's gone through the kiln, no longer can it be remolded, can it? There comes a point when it's fixed, this is how it is. It, and, and it's past then. If it then, whereas once it's a, a, the wet clay, it can be molded, reshaped. God will keep working with it, no problem at all. But if in the end people don't want what God's ways, then he will let them be fixed as they want to be. And if it's a vessel that he doesn't want, in the end, it'll be smashed to pieces. And that's what's happening here, isn't it? Notice. It's not because God is an unjust God. God is a just God. They've filled this place with the blood of innocence. See that phrase at the end of verse four? And hopefully your margin will take you to. <coughs> Sorry about that. Your margin will take you to 2 Kings 21 verse 16. You got that in your margin? The blood of innocence. 2 Kings 21 16. Who's that? It's Manasseh. That's what they've done. They filled it with the blood of innocence, Josiah's grandfather, remember. But I want you to notice that that phrase, the blood of innocence, is also picked up in the New Testament. So let's leave a marker again and go forward now to Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27. So here, Judas has betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read in verse four that Judas says, I have sinned 
in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. So you see the connection back to Jeremiah 19 in verse 4. This place has been filled with the blood of innocence. And you see, it's that attitude, okay, of people who are rejecting the word of God that have ended up rejecting the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? I've betrayed the blood of innocence. Innocent blood, we see there. We keep going. He said, what's that to us, the priest? See thou to it. And so Judas, verse five, cast down the piece of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver piece and said, it is not lawful for us to put them in the treasury because it's the price of blood. So they took counsel and brought with them the potter's field to bury therein. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet. I wonder if that was actually what's just happened before, because actually the next quotation in verse nine is from Zechariah. But we're not going to get into that just now. If we turn to Acts chapter one, we'll pick up an even more graphic description of what happened to Judas. Acts chapter one. Judas, yeah, we know he recognized that he had betrayed the blood of innocence. And he hung himself in an Acts one and verse 18. Read this. Now, this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst. All his bowels gushed out. And that's pretty awful, isn't it, to read that? But you see, the point is this. Judas became a hardened vessel. His mind was fixed on his way. So in the end, he burst asunder like a hardened vessel. Remember what Jeremiah had to do? God said to him, take hold of that pot, that hard pot that's fixed in its own ways and smash it on the ground and tell them this is what will happen to you. And here we see Judas, who betrayed God, shed innocent blood, went his own way, is now broken like the potter's vessel. And it's the inside, like the liquid in a vessel, pours out. Judas wasn't malleable. He was fixed in what he wanted to do. Other disciples, they made mistakes, but they were malleable. And so in Judas, we see the fate of those who won't accept God's ways, who won't allow God to work in their lives. He represents any in the end who, who decide to push their own way, kick against God, won't listen to the son of God. Those nations, those people, those individuals who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes back, look how it's described in Psalm 2. They'll be dashed in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's Psalm 2 speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. It says, kiss the sun lest you perish. You've got a choice. Will you listen to the Lord Jesus and change? Or do you want to just be dashed in pieces like a potter's vessel? It's powerful stuff, isn't it? And the lesson is there for us to listen to the word of God. Let him mold us. We'll come back to Jeremiah 19 because Jeremiah goes back to the temple in Jerusalem to tell the people their fate. In Jeremiah 19, verse 14, it says, Then came Jeremiah from Tophet. So he's been in the valley with these elders. He smashed this pot up. And now he comes back from the valley, back into the city. And he's, he's going to tell them what has happened. He says, he stood in the court of the Lord's house, back in the temple court, said to all the people, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I'll bring upon this city and upon all her towns all the evil that I've pronounced against it, because they've hardened their necks. OK, they've hardened their necks. So they're like those vessels that are hard that need to just be broken. They might not hear my words. They won't be molded by the word of God. Well, do the people want to hear it? No, they do not. And so this brings trouble. Verse one of chapter 20. Now, Pasha, the son of Emma, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard the things that Jeremiah prophesied. So you can see after chapter 19, easy to put chapter 20. And they're so clear, isn't it? He heard what Jeremiah is saying. Then 
Pasha smote Jeremiah the prophet, put him in the stocks that were in the upper gate, the higher gate of Benjamin, which was in the house of the Lord. And so you can see that Pasha smites Jeremiah. And we're not talking about him just sort of punching him in the face sort of thing. This could be the full 39 stripes. It's the same word as in Deuteronomy 25 and verse 3. He was put there in the stocks, which were a form of torture. It had been twisted to cause pain. And Pasha did it in the gate of Benjamin. Did you notice that in verse 2? Why would he do that? To humiliate Jeremiah, knowing that people would walk past to know him, hoping to debase him. You now, if we look at a, a map, Jeremiah's hometown is in Anathoth. OK, now we've already touched on that, but Anathoth is in the territory of the land of Benjamin. OK, so. You can see from the, the, the map there, or the, sorry, not the map so much as the diagram of the city, that the Sheep Gate, Benjamin's Gate, is in the north of the city. So it's been put up there so that people that then go, so look at the map where Anathoth is, anyone going to Anathoth to Benjamin would go through that gate. So it's been put there to try to humiliate him. So the people walking out know him and are unkind to him. Just come, maybe we'll stick this in our margins in a moment. See what you think. Come to Lamentations 1. Let's go there first, and then you can decide whether to stick it in your margin or not. Lamentations 1. So I believe that this is when Jeremiah is in the stocks, in that gate, trapped in real pain, and people are going far past and mocking him. Lamentations 1 verse 12. Is it nothing to you or you that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. From above hath he sent fire into my bones and it prevaileth against me. Now, the fire that's in his bones, just let's keep a note here. Jeremiah 20 says this in verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him anymore, nor speak of his name, but his word was a fire in my heart. OK, a burning shut up in my bones. So very clearly, the fire that's in his bones from verse 13 is the word of God that keeps coming to him. But he recognizes that as he's telling people about the word of God, they don't want to hear it. So he ends up being afflicted. He says, from above, hath he set fire into my bones, and it prevailed against me. He spread a net for my feet. He's turned me back. He made me desolate and faint all the day. The yoke of my transgressions, I'd say that's the stocks, is bound by his hand. They are wreathed and come up upon my neck. He has made my strength to fall. The Lord has delivered me into their hands, and from whom I am not able to rise up. He can't stand. He's in these stocks. So I think that those verses, if we went back to Jeremiah 20 and verse 2, I would happily stick in my margin. In fact, I have already. Lamentations 1, verse 12 to 16. Picture Jeremiah in this grim place. In the morning, Pasha comes to release him and Jeremiah slowly gets up. You can imagine he's sore. He spent a night weeping in prayer to God. He says in verse 3, the Lord has not called thy name Pasha, but Megor Mishabib. Now, I mean, this just blows me away, seeing Jeremiah's like confidence in God here, that despite the fact he's been in this all night long, he's in serious pain. He gets up. He still has got the guts to say this. Instead of saying, sorry, Pasha, I'll see you later. He says, the Lord has not called thy name Pasha, which means liberated but called you Megor Misabib, terror on every side. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive unto Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Pasha would be terrified when the Babylonian army came, and he was taken to Babylon. 
no longer liberated, Pasha, but rather shackled. And the irony is that people who think they're liberated and free are actually the ones who are shackled. You know, I remember years ago, I went on a school trip with some kids and another teacher, and we took these kids to Greece. And either say, I jumped on to get involved with this one because I took these kids to Mars Hill. Now, remember, Mars Hill is where the Apostle Paul is stood and he's telling them about the fact that you've got all these gods that are for nothing, these idols. But he says, I'm going to tell you about the unknown God. And I was on Mars Hill with these kids and uh, another teacher. And uh, I was explaining this to them and to this teacher. And sh she just couldn't get out of it. She was like, what? You know, how can you have that? Surely, how, how could you possibly say that these people's uh, idols were nothing? Uh, everybody can have their God. You know, there's no problem at all. She couldn't get her head around the idea that there was such a thing as truth. Jesus said the truth will set you free. You know, I read that in your readings just recently. The truth will set you free. You know, we need to ensure that we're malleable. If we open our ears and our hearts to God, then he can work wonderful things in us and we can be free. And by that, I mean the sense that actually you're, you're liberated to kind of want to please God. You're not any longer pulled down by the struggle of uh, our human nature and by the fact that actually we just simply go into the grave. We've been made free by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can live knowing that we've got the hope of the kingdom and eternal life. What, what a nonsense to pretend that actually anything goes. Of course, there's something that's true and right. Now, of course, there's right and there's wrong. You know, it makes utter sense. It makes sense in any moment. Don't tell any school teacher that there's no such thing as right and wrong. They'll tell you, of course there is. You need to be right. There needs to be rules in the classroom. Don't tell any family there's no such thing as right and wrong. Of course there is. Family life doesn't work if everyone can just do whatever they want the whole time. It doesn't work. And so in society in general, of course there's such a thing as right and wrong. And what an arrogant thing to think that actually we were the ones who should be deciding it and making it up. No wonder in such a mess. Have the humility to say, wow, this word of God, there's signs to show it is the word of God. I'm going to trust this. I've suddenly been liberated because I know now what is right and wrong. I know how I should be living my life. And what's more, I've got the hope of a kingdom. The truth will set you free. Everything else will pull you down. Well, this episode brings Jeremiah in prayer to God. It says in verse seven, oh, Lord, you've deceived me and I was deceived. You are stronger than I and has prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. And what Jeremiah is saying is, look, Lord, you've persuaded me. Look at the margin for deceived, OK, enticed or persuaded. Lord, you've persuaded me and I'm being persuaded. You know, it's the continuous tense in the second word, deceived. So he says, look, you have in the past persuaded me. He's persuaded him by the word of God, of course, to, you know, helped him to believe. And you continue to persuade me that you are stronger than me and you will prevail. And despite the difficulties and struggles in Jeremiah's life, he knows he'll come through. And so he says, in verse nine, I said, I will not make mention of him anymore. So he says every now and again, Jeremiah says, right, I'm, not, I'm just not going to keep telling people about this. But then his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. I cannot weary with forbearing. I can't stay. I can't stop myself. For I heard the defaming of many fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watched for my halting saying, peradventure, he will be enticed. He will be persuaded. We shall prevail against him. We shall take our revenge on him. His enemies think that they will persuade him, that they'll prevail against him and pull him off course. They're the same words that he's already used. Yet this man of faith trusts in God, verse 11. But Yahweh is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten the creator who had performed him and said to him they shall not fight against thee i'm uh, quoting from the beginning of jeremiah they shall not fight against thee god had told him 
They shall not, or they will fight against thee, but they won't prevail against thee. For I am with you, saith the Lord. And you can see that's the language that Jeremiah is now drawing on. He can remember, as he's saying there in verse 11, they shall not prevail. God had promised him they won't prevail. And Jeremiah believes it. And that's really the challenge for us all. Will we let God work in our lives? Will we allow him to mold us into something very good? In the end, it's our choice. But God will willingly give us what we want. If we have got this desire, God will willingly help us to get to the kingdom, to make sure we are vessels prepared unto glory. So therefore, keep allowing yourself to be persuaded. Keep opening up the word. Keep seeing these things and allow yourself to be persuaded that he will get you to the kingdom. We'll finish there.